Well, it naturally got a little quieter, so I think you guys are ready to go. Welcome to church this morning. Everybody doing good? Yes, that was awesome. I don't even have to ask you to do it again. It's 81 degrees. It is fall in Indiana. We are happy to be here. Why don't you stand up with me? We're going to read scripture before we go into worship this morning. So I'm going to read from Psalm 95. If you want to go there, you can, or you can just listen as we read. Psalm 95. I tried to look up a psalm this morning that was a call to worship, and I realized almost all psalms are a call to worship, so I just picked Psalm 95 because I like it. So here we go. Oh, come, let us sing to, for the joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods, in whose hands are the depths of the earth, the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for it is he who made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, but turn to the Lord. Amen. So I want to tell you something before we go into worship. Um, you know, worship is not a performance, right? You know that, yes? We're not standing in front of the Lord just, just singing because we happen to be here on Sunday mornings together. We're not singing because there's words on the screen, but we're actually singing to encounter the presence of God and the person of God. You know, worship is actually a two-way act. When I was a kid, I used to kind of feel guilty about how good I felt after worship was done. You know, I worship the Lord. I'm like, man, I feel great for worship, but worship is supposed to be about God. And I used to try to like out worship God where it's like, okay, I'm going to worship him so hard today that I'm going to know he got more out of it than I did. And it, it, it never worked <laughs> because in worship, you are encountering God. And so the more you worship him, the more he pours into your life, the more loved you feel the more peace that comes over you, the more healing that happens in your heart and the more revelation you get about who God is, which causes you to wanna to worship him more, right? That is the beauty and the joy of worship. It is not just a time to come and to sing songs and to stand and perform in front of God, but is it a time to encounter our loving heavenly father. So when you worship this morning, I want you to engage with him and I want you to receive, right? This is a time to focus on the Lord and to give our glory and all glory and honor and praise to him. But it's also a time to let him minister to you. There's a lot of powerful things that can happen in worship. You don't need someone else to lay hands on you. You don't need Pastor Tim to pray for you. You just need to meet with God. And worship is the time for that. Open your heart to what he has for you this morning. If you have fears or anxieties, allow the Lord to bring peace in your heart today during worship. If you need to feel his love, allow him to pour his love over you today in worship. If you need healing in your body, as you're worshiping the Lord, receive the truth that God wants you to be healed. Encounter him this morning as we worship. Encounter the most high God because that's really why we're here. So Father, we thank you that we have relationship with you. God, that you not, are not just a figure in our lives that we stand before and perform once a week on a Sunday morning, God, but you are our father. You are the lover of our souls. You are pursuing us. And God, I thank you that we have the blessing and the privilege to be able to come together as the body of Christ and worship you. You are so worthy to be praised. And God, in this moment of worship, Lord, I ask that we open our hearts to what you have for us. We open our hearts to receive your truth. We open our hearts to receive your peace and your love, your joy and your healing. God, we thank you for the encounter that we are going to have with you this morning. We expect to meet with you here today. We thank you, Father, for who you are and that you sent your son Jesus so that we can have this kind of relationship with you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's worship our God this morning.
Like the break of dawn Giving blind men sight Letting lame men walk I see a generation With resurrection life We are a generation Filled with the power of Christ And our song it will
God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. And time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. And though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting same I will praise your name. Oh, great is your faithfulness to to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same, your history can prove, there's nothing you can't do, you're faithful and true, and though the storms may come in the winds, may blow out in may stay.
talking about worship being an encounter with the most high God. And um, a lot of you know this about me. Some of you don't, but uh, there was a three or four year period of my life where I was having lots of miscarriages. I ended up having four miscarriages. And before I had any children and my, um, my heart was grieved in that time. And I, I felt let down and I felt like God had let me down. And I remember we sang this song at one point, Um, when I was in a pretty dark spot and the Lord said, just sing that I've never let you down because the truth is I've never let you down. And we've been let down, right? We've been let down by life. We've been let down by people. We've been let down by circumstances, but we've never been let down by God. And as I sang this, so much healing came to my heart because I really started to believe that God had never let me down. You know, worship is powerful. When you declare the truth about who he is and who he is in your life, your heart begins to be healed. Your mind begins to be set free. You begin to believe the truth that God is faithful even when maybe nobody else is in your life. That God will not let you down even though everything else around you looks like it's falling and crumbling. He will never let you down. Go ahead and sing that again, Alyssa.
great is your faithfulness, Father. You are a faithful God. Lord, we remind ourselves of the times that you have been faithful to us. We remind ourselves of the times that you have come through when no one else did, of the times when we needed a word of encouragement and you were there, a person to, to stand with us and you brought that person in our lives. God, when we needed hope, you gave us hope. When we needed faith, you gave us faith, Father, that you are faithful. You are faithful and we declare that you have never let us down. You have never let us down, God. You are worthy to be praised. We thank you, Father, for encountering us this morning. God, we thank you for meeting with us today, that we are able to worship you and give you glory and honor and praise. And it's in Jesus' name we're able to come. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, go ahead and have a seat, guys. We have the awkward transition now. We don't get to hug one another and say hello. Um, but we are glad that you are here with us, whether you are here in person or whether you are here online watching. We are happy that you are here with us this morning. Uh, so I'm Leslie Absher. For those of you that don't know me, I have the privilege of speaking every once in a while at this church. It's great. I'm glad to be able to be in front of you this morning. I um, have a couple announcements, which I always forget. Can you grab me that paper, Tim? Sorry. It's behind you. We have no podium anymore because of the live stream, so usually I have the announcements just sitting on this nice podium. Thank you, sir. All right, so a couple of announcements we've got to get through. Um, we have kids ministry. By the way, you know this is a family church, right? Everyone is welcome here, all generations. Students, we love having you. Families, we love having you. And we have a wonderful kids ministry. We have lots of kids in this church, actually. Um, we have kids that get to be downstairs at the 11 o'clock service, which you are in right now. But we also have kids ministry that's happening on Wednesdays now. And we know that during a coronavirus life that things change on the fly. But this week, we are having Wednesday night services as of right now. Uh, so we would love to have you be with us at 6.30 in our Wednesday Wednesday services, G3 Kids, Genesis Youth, and starting this week, we're going to have adults classes as well. So these are one of my favorite things that Genesis Church come together in small groups of people and dig into the word and dig a little deeper into a specific topic. So this Wednesday, we're going to start 6.30 reading The Deeply Formed Life. Uh, Tim's going to be teaching to us about different values and how they root ourselves in Jesus. And so we're excited about this. Um, you can come anytime. If you're going to miss a week, that's fine. We still want you to come each week. You'll get something different out of it. Here's the topics. You can see a little bit more about it on the website as well. But talking about things that are really meaningful, especially right now, right? Um, yeah, I'll let Tim teach on it. But you don't want to miss it. It's going to be really great. I'm very excited about it. So it starts this week at 6.30 on Wednesday night. Uh, hopefully we'll have nursery. Tim will tell us about that if that's happening. But we're trying to get some uh, nursery care. But we definitely will have children's church. So if you have older kids, please do not let that keep you from coming. All right, so baptismal service is our next announcement. So this is one of my all-time favorite services. I also like the baby dedications because there's cute babies in front of us. But baptismal service is great because it's a time for people to celebrate um, in front of all of us, you know, their commitment to the Lord. It's really a celebratory service. So if that is you, if you want to be baptized November 1st in the 11 o'clock service, um, and then come join with us and watch it and celebrate with those people that are giving their lives to Christ in a public way. It's a really exciting time. Um, Okay, and then it is October, even though it's 81 degrees outside. It is October. So we are going to have a harvest party. So it's a great way to be outside. We'll be able to socially distance, but still be able to be around one another and fellowship. So we will be having our harvest party on October 30th, which is right before Halloween. Friday at 6 p.m. at Vadim and Hillary's house. We will send out instructions about where that's at in emails, so watch for that. But we would love to have you at the harvest party. Dress up if that's your thing. Don't dress up if it's not. We'd love to have you. There will be food there. There will be fellowship and friends and movie night. So come out and hang out outdoors. Hopefully it'll be semi-chilly at that point, but we'll see. Um, but we would love to have you at the harvest party. Okay, I think that's all my announcements. We're going to take up our tithes and offerings, even though we don't really take them up anymore. But we would love you to um, be able to give to the church in any way that you can. There is a basket in the back for those of you in the room. You can place your offering back there. But you can also give online. We are, you know, in the 21st century. So you can go to igenesischurch.com slash give and give. So I'm going to pray over the offering before Pastor Tim comes up. Father, we just thank you for... 
the blessings you pour over all of us. Even in difficult times, God, we are blessed. Um, And we thank you, Father, that you have given us those blessings. And we thank you, Lord, that giving is a way that we can give back to you. It's a way we can sow into the kingdom. It's a way we can choose to trust you with our finances, to to watch out for our needs, Father. And so we bless this this gift this morning. We bless this offering this morning. And we bless the people giving. Uh, We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Peter, can I get your help, man? You can grab that pulpit. That'd be great. So awesome. Thanks, dude. Let's give it up for Peter today. Yeah. The man. Awesome. Well, we welcome you here to Genesis Church. So glad to have you join with us. Look, he got that all by himself. This dude, this dude is swole. He's, uh, he's, got, some, he's got some moose schools on him. So thank you, Peter. I appreciate it, man. Awesome. Um, that's annoying having to do that, but because of our live stream now, uh, with the camera angle dead on, um, we just are doing that right now. So, all right, let's go back to a slide. Uh, before I get to that, my name's Sam. I have the wonderful privilege and honor of pastoring this congregation. We welcomed you to our 11 o'clock service, and uh, thanks for joining with us. Let's go back to the deeply formed, um, the Wednesday night slide, the deeply formed life. Um, I, I want to just reiterate a couple things on this. During the corona season quarantine, Spiritual formations is always big for us here at Genesis Church. This is something we spend our midweeks on over and over and over again, teaching on the importance and value of spiritual formation. Um, And and there's many reasons for that. But during the quarantine, I I really felt like that was uh, exposed tremendously in the church of just how much there is a lack of spiritual formation and discipleship in our churches in America and how we need it so vitally. If you go to the next slide that's connected to this on the five weeks, um, these are, these are uh, different weeks we're going to spend on uh, these subjects that I believe are so vital and important for us in the 21st century. And so week one, contemplative rhythms for an exhausted life. Anybody feel exhausted during the last eight months? Can we just be honest and say confession is good for the soul? Uh, even Pastor Tim, who's very energetic and high energy and driven and go, go, go. I, ha- I have had moments of exhaustion in the last eight months. And our world is, is exhausted. Our country is exhausted. And so um, contemplative rhythms for an exhausted life. Week two, I'm really excited. Racial reconciliation for a divided world. This may be one of the most important uh, things that we need as a church especially the evangelical church, have to address and address well in the 21st century moving forward. And so I want to teach um, a real kingdom ethic, robust theology around reconciliation, especially racial, racial reconciliation, how that is of God's heart. Amen. That is absolutely at the heart of God. And then I'm really excited because we're going to have actually a panel discussion at the end of it where I'm going to have several people from the African American community that are just going to share some thoughts, some experiences of their upbringing and their uh, their, their life growing up in this country, and then just some encouragements for us. And so I, I invite you to be a part of that because that will be a very vital uh, week. Interior examination for a world living on the surface. What does it mean to go deep, to be self-aware, practice that? Um, there is a lack of self-awareness in today's society. And self-awareness is connected to the idea, are you aware of how others are experiencing you? Are you aware of how others are interpreting you? And many times we're not. We're just not aware of of how we're coming across, how we're portraying ourselves, and really the deep-rooted issues that we're wrestling with and struggling with. And then week four, uh, sexual wholeness for a culture that splits bodies from souls. Uh, That's going to be a very important, that's not just for married couples, that's for college students, uh, for for any generation, except for younger generations, they'll be downstairs. Um, We want to go deep in understanding a biblical idea of sexuality and the importance of why we think biblically about that issue um, because there's a lot of things that are, that are challenging that today and we have to be aware of what we're facing in that regard. And then week five, missional presence in a distracted and disengaged world. What does it mean to be on mission as a body of Christ? Um, not just relying on vocational paid ministers to do the work of ministry, which we're actually going to talk about here today. Uh, in Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, but what does it mean to equip the entirety of the body and say you are sent out on mission. So I encourage you, mark your calendar for that. We'd love to have you come join with us. We are working on hiring a couple of students that would be able to uh, help us out in nursery for ages six months to three years old, and uh, we'd love to have you join us for that. All right, let's get our Bibles. You ready to get into the Word? Amen. Great mentor of mine used to always say, get into the Word, and the Word will get into you. Amen? Mark your Bible, Tim, and the Bible will mark you. That's how he used to say it. So 
Um, we love getting into the scriptures here at Genesis Church. And right now we are in a series on the book of Ephesians where we're just walking through chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Now, I, I want to preface this. Um, this morning's message will feel a little choppy at times. Um, it will feel a little bit like we're here and then we're here and then we're over here. Um, but just stay with it. There will be some good takeaways. There will be some stuff you're like, I really don't care about any of this. But it's important. Um, and then there will be other stuff that you'll be like, yeah, I'm really in on this point. Um, but just stay with it because the way this text flows is kind of choppy, the way Paul wrote it. And so it will feel that way as I'm preaching it. But before I get to that series, um, I grew up, I was born in 1982, back in 82, throw a pigskin a quarter mile. No one got that. All right. So Napoleon Dynamite people, come on, Uncle Rico. Oh, never mind. All right, let's try again. I grew up in the 80s and the 90s. And the 90s were my formative years in middle school and high school. And um, recently on Netflix, there was a series that just came out called The Last Dance. And it's about the 90s Bulls from 96, 97, 98. Anybody watch The Last Dance? Uh, the, the series about the Chicago Bulls. Now, I rooted against the Bulls every, every year. I, I was rooting for Phoenix. I mean, I was rooting for um, Utah Jazz twice, Seattle, Kemp, Rainman. I was rooting, always rooting against the Bulls. And every time I came out on the bottom of that, right, Michael Jordan, the GOAT, by the way, just in case you're wondering, thank you. All right, the GOAT. Um, always ended up just taking care of business. But I love watching the, the Last Dance recently and just looking at those, those key years, 96, 97, and 98, and just watching the dynamics within the team. And I coach high school basketball. A couple of my players attend here. And um, I love coaching basketball. And one thing I know as a coach is that it is important to define roles within a team and have people understand how they contribute to the greater of the entirety of the team. If you had a team just full of Michael Jordans, we'd think that would be amazing. But it's not amazing because there wouldn't be enough basketball to go around. And the beauty about the Chicago Bulls is that they had Scottie Pippen, who loved being that player B, that second guy who's like, I don't need to get 40 a game, but I can chip in when Michael's on the bench or when Michael's hurt, or I can go and do other things. I can. Scottie Pippen could flat out guard any position on the floor, one through five. The dude was amazing. But one of my favorite players on the Bulls was Dennis Rodman. Dennis, the worm, as they nicknamed Dennis Rodman was crazy. I mean, that guy, he, something was off. He had all the dyed hair, all the tattoos, all the piercings. But Dennis Rodman was probably the most important player on the 90s Bulls team. Because he understood his role. He didn't care if he scored one bucket the entire game. He was out there to get rebounds. He was out there to get steals and blocks. He was out there to set dirty picks. I mean, dirty picks. He didn't stand that. He was like chopping you and hitting you and doing all kinds of dirty things, grabbing your shorts. And he was there to get into people's minds, especially the opposing team's star player. And in the um, Last Dance series on Netflix, there's a time, and I remember it. It's like my, my high school year is coming alive where Rodman just went MIA. He was just missing it. Nobody knew where he was. And Michael Jordan, the GOAT, and Scottie Pippen, one of the top 50 players of all time, knew if we're going to succeed this year, we have got to go find Rodman. We need him on this team. He is such a, a vital piece. And they went, and Rodman was doing all kinds of crazy things we won't talk about here on Sunday morning. But anyways, they found him. They said, knock it off. Get back to the team. We need you. The guy who averaged like 1.7 points per game was one of the most important players on the Chicago Bulls. And they went on that year to win the championship again and just established this beautiful dynasty going three Repeat twice. Um, they did it in the 90s, and just an incredible thing. Well, this morning, as we get to this text, we're going to talk about what many term five fold ministry gifts. And we're going to bring some clarification, I think, to this, and hopefully by the end of it, understand that each and every single person in the body of Christ needs to understand how they are how they are wired how they are anointed and called, and their function, and how they can contribute to the body of Christ. And each gift is essential and important. Many times in Western culture, we view things in hierarchical realms. But you have to understand, in the biblical context, it's about each gift flourishing and being used and contributing to the greater good of the body of Christ. Now, if you remember from last week, I said that Ephesians 4 through 6, uh, one of the overriding motifs is that of unity. And we talked about this idea of unity in Christ, being unified vertically, and then unified horizontally one with another. And so Paul addresses unity with Christ, unity with the church, and then also unity in the home. And I think it's a very timely, 
uh, season in the church for us to be talking about this idea of unity as we are quickly approaching uh, election day in November. Every four years, probably the most divided time in the church of Jesus Christ in America is election year, bar none. I've been here 20 years, and every four years, I dread it. I literally dread it. And I think, oh, here we go. It's about to get crazy. But I think it's so important that we have a biblical, robust understanding of what biblical unity looks like. So let's get into the text here. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, and Paul says this, and he, being Jesus, and remember last week, he descended to the earth, he ascended into heaven, and when he ascended, he sent his spirit, and when he sent his spirit, he gave gifts. And he gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, also could be pastors there, and teachers. Verse 12, why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. I'll throw in there by conspiracy theories. All right, verse 15. Rather, speaking the truth in love. And I want you to hear my heart here this morning as I speak. There will be times it may come across somewhat cynical or somewhat corrective. But hear my heart. It is rooted in love. All right? Everyone say this. Say, Pastor Tim loves us. All right? Say, say it to your neighbor. Say, Pastor Tim loves us. All right? We just got we to gotta reiterate that. Paul says, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up. In every way into him who is the head and into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So that that, that last line, when each part working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, when it comes to this portion of Scripture, and also a couple of other Pauline texts where it speaks on the spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit. Throughout church history, there have predominantly been two different views on these portions of Scripture. The first view is what's called cessationism. And here's the idea behind cessationism. cessationism. Some of you, you grew up in churches like this, uh, and you know that. Some of you grew up in churches like this, and you don't even know that. They just never talked about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They never talked about the offices of fivefold ministry. They just skipped over those portions of Scripture and essentially said, that's not for today. But the idea behind cessationism, cessationism is the gifts of the Spirit and the offices, especially of apostle and prophet, ceased after the original 12 because the written, inspired, authoritative word of the New Testament manuscripts were circulating enough and these supernatural gifts meant to bring validity to the authority and testimony of the early apostles were no longer needed. So once the apostles began to write down the manuscripts, the inspired, authoritative word of God, and they were circulating amongst the church, they didn't need supernatural gifts, super, supernatural offices, uh, signs and wonders to validify their authority. They were circulating amongst the church. That is, in essence, a very brief version of cessationism. Now, continuationism is what uh, I adhere to, and I believe it has been all throughout church history, not just uh, in time frames, but it's been all throughout church history, though it's been dormant in a majority of places. There are pockets of it. Continuationism teaches that all the gifts of the Spirit and the offices and functions of Ephesians 4 gifts have not ceased and were never meant to until Jesus' second coming. And so in this church age, all the gifts of the Spirit and the offices and functions of the five-fold ministry things, Paul says, have not ceased and they won't cease until Jesus returns. Why? Simply because I believe Scripture does not teach us that they ceased anywhere. I think it is terrible exegesis of the text to develop some type of doctrine to say that the gifts have ceased. Some point to 1 Corinthians 13, the perfect is not the canonization of Scripture. The perfect is Jesus. 
He is the perfect. He is the full revelation of the, of the mystery that God has brought into the earth. Some point to Ephesians 2.20, the founding. There is really no good exegesis scripturally to show that um, the spiritual gifts and the offices have ceased. Now, most people, when you push them far enough, they get to abuse. They get to manipulation. And I can say as a classical fourth generation Pentecostal on my mom's side, amen. <laughs> I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly with it. But I've, been, I've encountered the authentic. And so I'm not going to dismiss the authentic because of the counterfeit. I'm going to pursue and teach the authentic. Now, I want to bring a clarification as well as a caution. And if you're bored for right now, just stay with us. It'll, it'll get on a different train for a moment. But first, a clarification. Number one, there are not modern day apostles like the original apostles of the first century. Those that were meant to write and speak authoritatively for the purpose of Scripture. So when we say there are apostles today, we're not saying like the apostles, disciples of Jesus, like the apostle Paul. They don't have the revelation to uh, uh, inscribe Scripture that is authoritative on the same level of the word. Some talk about capital A apostle and small a apostle. But there is a function of apostolic ministry. Now a caution. Beware of anyone, anyone who uses a self-proclaimed title. So when someone says, hi, I'm apostle so-and-so, or I'm prophet so-and-so, and you see this sometimes in TV ministry, I'm not saying they aren't. I'm just saying be cautious of that. Those that I know that are in fact apostolic, are in fact prophetic, never have to use titles to use it for themselves. They just do. They just be. They just are apostolic. And people recognize that gifting on their life. So I know people that I would say, they are apostles. They are modern day apostles. But the church identifies it. The people around them recognize it. Not them trying to say, I'm apostle so and so. I'm prophet so and so. Just be cautious of that. Because many times when people do that, they're trying to attribute fame to their name that is not supposed to be done. Now in saying that, do I believe in modern day apostles and modern day prophets? Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's look at this slide here. When it comes to these fivefold ministry gifts, I like to say that they're more functions than they are offices. I'm not saying there aren't offices, but I think we would do better to focus on the function of these gifts. And so apostles, and by the way, that word apostle Jesus borrowed and Paul borrowed from the Greco-Roman world. An apostle was one who when Caesar overthrew a, a region or a city or empire, they would send apostles. First they would send evangelists to announce. Then they would send apostles in. And the apostles were meant to teach this new city or region the culture and the language and the governance of Rome. So that's, that's a Greco-Roman world there. Jesus just borrowed that. And he essentially equips his disciples to be apostles. And he sends them out on mission Essentially, I want, I want you to go and teach and model the culture, the language, and the governance of the kingdom of heaven. Are you with me? All right, so apostles govern. Apostles are usually people that are 30,000 30, foot view. Prophets guide, right? Prophetic people all through scripture, and I believe today, are those that not just exhort and encourage and edify that Paul talks about in Corinthians, but they are those that say, hey, I feel the Spirit is saying to me, we're off course. We, we have gone a wrong direction here. We need to repent, and we need to turn back to way, towards the way of Jesus. That is a prophetic function. We need that gift today like never before in the church in America. Hey, we're off course. We've allowed the church to become something that God might not be pleased with. Let's repent. Let's return towards being the people of Jesus. Evangelists, they gather. They're the, they're the extrovert type of personality. Wherever they go, they're telling people about Jesus. Anybody from Chi Alpha remember Matt O? Matt Ostermeyer, right? Matt Ostermeyer is a legendary in Chi Alpha. This dude got saved at IU, radically saved, and everywhere Matt O went, he just started telling people about Jesus. Like, it didn't matter where he was. There are many people in Chi Alpha today that are there because Matt O brought them to Chi Alpha and they came to Jesus. He's an evangelist. He can't not talk about Jesus. It's so deeply ingrained in him. Pastors, shepherds, they guard. They protect. Right? That's why they're called shepherds. They protect the flock. They care and nurture for the flock. And then teachers... 
they, they ground, they keep us solid in God's word. Now let me say this, I believe that every single Christian has one of these themes that they're predominant in, though I believe that every Christian can function in these gifts at some point in time. So for instance, I, I probably think apostolically, but my, my main gift is I teach. I love to teach. I love to go deep in doctrine and theology and wrestle with tensions. But that doesn't mean that God can't use me to prophesy. I, I'm not a prophet. It's not something that I do often. But there are times the Spirit puts in my heart a prophetic word to speak into someone's life. And I feel the Spirit impressing that upon my heart and I share it. Now, next slide here. That's kind of from a biblical understanding. But, it, sorry, next slide here. If we look at it from kind of a, an attribute or a characteristic type of thing, what you see is that these are ty the types of functions amongst these fivefold gifts. So the apostolic person it tends to be more entrepreneurial, pioneer, strategist, innovative, and visionary. Once again, they're, they're 30,000 foot view all the time. They're not good with the details. They don't like to get into the nitty gritty of things, but they got big vision. Uh, the disturber, the agitator, the questioner, those are usually the prophetic types. Uh, they're, they're the ones that Yes, often bring disturbance to the body of Christ, um, but in a good way. And, 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 and a way that's needed because they're not afraid to ask difficult questions. They're not afraid to confront idolatry. They're not afraid to say, once again, we're, we're off. We need to repent. Um, the passionate communicator, the organizational message, the recruiter, that's an evangelistic type of person. So maybe you're here today and that's you. Like you're just, man, we just want to recruit everyone to this. We just want to gather people into this. They're passionate about that. But the, the evangelists are usually not good on theology and teaching and deep things, right? And most of our churches today in America are led by evangelists. And their, their metrics are always numbers. And they don't care about discipleship as much. They just want to get people in. I don't care about deep theology and doctrine. I, I just want to get people to Jesus, right? Most of your churches today are led by those types of people. And they're needed, but often Discipleship only goes surface level. It doesn't go deep. It doesn't go beyond that. They need these other functions in the church. Uh, the philosopher, the systematizer, translator, that's usually the teacher. And then the carer, the social cement, the humanizer. Once again, that's the shepherd. That's the pastor. And so maybe you're here and you're just always a person that's caring for the needy. Or you're always concerned about what others are enduring. You're the empathetic type. Your brother, your sister, uh, your coworker is going through a hard time, and you just gravitate towards that. You're, you're fatherly, you're motherly, right? Even though you may not have even your own children, you just are wired that way. That's a pastoral kind of anointing and function on your lives. Now, I believe that in order for the church to be the unified, powerful organism that Christ intended it to be, we must have a body of believers where all of these fivefold functions are operating. And not just people that hold offices or hired clergy, but teams of people that are functioning. People that are apostolic, people that are prophetic, people that have a teaching gift. And they're, they're utilizing those gifts to contribute to the greater good. If you have a church, next slide here, that is all led by an apostolic person, and the other four gifts are neglected, this is what you will see. And this is... Uh, this, this is directly from a book called The Permanent Revolution, if you want to write that down by Alan Hirsch. He says this, if an apostolic leader dominates, the church will tend to be hard driving, autocratic, with lots of pressure for change and development, and will leave lots of wounded people in its wake. So if a church is led by only apostolic leadership, it will be driven, it will be, let's create, let's innovate, 30,000 foot view, get out of my way or I'm running you over. And you end up having a lot of hurt, wounded people in the body of Christ. Next one. If it's dominated by a prophetic person, if the prophetic leader dominates, the church will be one-dimensional, always harken back to one or two issues, and will likely be sectarian, will have a super spiritual vibe, or somewhat paradoxically will tend to either be too activist to be sustainable or too quietist to be useful. And so they're always active or on one or two great concerns, and they're passionate about those concerns, and they're calling the body to those concerns, and we need to be called to those concerns. But once again, if it's just all prophetic, it will be only that. Next slide. If it's all evangelist, when an evangelistic leader dominates, the church will have an obsession with numerical growth. It, it will create dependence, and it will be dependent upon charismatic leadership, and will tend to lack theological breadth 
and depth. This type of organization will not empower many people, but they're always looking for a tractional type of ministry and the metrics of numbers, butts and seats, and offerings, wallets, uh, money, that type of thing. And so where you see this a lot in the modern church is in church growth uh, programs, growth tracks, next steps. So-and-so from Arkansas did this program, growth tracks, the next step. So every evangelistic pastor uh, that has that gifting began to model that in the church. And it's all about raising up volunteers. And we'll get to that in a moment. You've got to have volunteers. But what happens is people begin to discover their gifts, and then they're not using their gifts. It's, oh, you tested high on the spiritual gifts assessment and prophetic. Go hold the sign in the parking lot that says, we're glad you're here. All right, go hold these balloons. And you tested high in evangelism, uh, be the head usher of our, you know. You tested high in teaching, uh, we really need kids workers right now, right. So it's all about raising up volunteers. And once again, evangelism is so needed, but if we only had that leading, we begin to miss some things in the body of Christ. S- still with me? All right, the next one, shepherd. When pastoral leadership monopolizes, the church or other organization will tend to be risk adverse codependent and needy, an overly lacking in healthy descent and therefore creativity. Such an organization will lack innovation and will not be able to transfer its core message and tasks from one generation to the next. I know churches that are led by true shepherd-only type of people, and they don't have the other giftings. And those people that are there are loved well, are guarded well. But once that group of people dies off, they haven't been able to translate the message to the next generation and raise up other gifting. And many times those type of contexts draw very needy people. And they get loved and they get healed and you want that, but then they never get empowered and released to be the people they were called to be. The next one, teacher. If it's all teacher, and oh man, this one hits home. This is like, someone get the dagger out of my back here, all right. So uh, when teachers and theologians rule, the church will be ideological, controlling, moralistic, and somewhat uptight. Ouch. A rationalistic, doctrine-obsessed, Christian Gnosticism, the idea that we are saved by what we know, will tend to replace reliance on the Holy Spirit. These types of organizations will be exclusive based on ideology like that of the Pharisee. So because I'm wired strong as that way, if I'm not careful and don't surround myself with these other gifts and functions, I'm going to do nothing but raise up a bunch of Pharisees. That's what it's saying here. And we want to guard against that. The self-righteous elitism. We know what we know. We know more than you, so we're better than you. No, that's not what we need in the predominance of the church. Now, next slide. The threefold purpose of these gifts, Paul says, are, number one, for the equipping of the saints. Number two, for the work of ministry. And number three, for the building up of unity and maturity in the body of Christ. This word equip in the original language, it means to train, to furnish, to instruct, and to perfect. And what Jesus intended and what Paul reiterates here in his epistle is that the church was meant to be a place where people came and gathered, worshiped, fellowship, partook of the sacraments, and then were released on mission. It's a training center. And it's not about one person. It's not about the hired professional, the pastor with the salary. But it's about many people. Everyone say many. It's about many. A plurality of leadership. A plurality of voices. A plurality of giftings. Using their gifts in the church. Equipping others and sending those people out on mission. For the work of ministry. So that we build up in maturity and in unity. And if we only rely on the professional voices, the hired pastor, clergy, however you want to say it, the vocational ministry, to do all of these things, we will never obtain the unity and the maturity that Jesus attended. You're not here just to consume information. You're here to be transformed more into the image of Jesus, discover your anointing and gifting, and then rise and flourish in that in the marketplace, in your neighborhood, in your classroom, in your core group, in your city, in your community, in your business endeavor, whatever it is. You're called to rise and flourish in those things and use it all for the glory of God. Now, we must see that the intention of Jesus in empowering his church with these gifts 
was no one person, function, or gift would dominate or be disproportionately represented in the church, thus leading to excess, abuse, or imbalance. Leadership of his church, his, Jesus' church, was always meant to be done in teams sharing the responsibility and celebrating the unique gifts that each bring to the table. Never despising a gift, never neglecting a gift, and never grandstanding any gift. Once again, we always think hierarchical, top down. In Hebraic understanding, it was organic grassroots from within. And so it's not apostle, prophet, teacher way down here. It's all five working together, functioning together, uh, ministering together to raise up a people and teams that would operate and function in these gifts. You understand that? I could spend like two and a half hours probably just breaking down those gifts, but I don't have time. we got to go on to some other stuff. So here comes the choppiness. Transition to Verse 14, here we go. So that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. When Paul says no longer children, he's speaking of spiritual immaturity. He's speaking of a defenseless mindset. He's speaking of easy prey for false teachers. And so what Paul says is that once again, Jesus, he descended in the incarnation last week. He ascended into heaven. He sent down his spirit. With his spirit came many gifts that empowered people to function and operate in a five-fold anointing so that we may no longer be spiritually immature and deceived and believe false doctrine and false teaching and easily swayed by YouTube videos. Because if it's on the internet, it's got to be true. I think Abe Lincoln quoted that one time, right? If my person that I love and trust sent it to me, then it must be valid. If it has good editing and creepy music, then it's not really a conspiracy theory. It must be real. Right? And, and, and Paul says, no, I, I have given these gifts so that you may be alert. So that you won't be deceived. So that you may grow in unity and maturity as the powerful ecclesia that I have called you to. Paul also had to address this in the church of Corinth. Um, in 1 Corinthians 2, he also used that language. You're spiritual infants. You're desiring milk. You can't even move on to meat. And you have to understand, he's saying that to a super, uber, hyper charismatic congregation that had what's called an over-realized eschatology, meaning they thought because they spoke in tongues and could prophesy that they, they could live however they want. It was like this charismatic Gnosticism going on. And they thought they could just live and be and do And they thought they were super mature because they had all this revelation. They had all these insights. They could pray in tongues better than anyone. They could prophesy better than anyone. And Paul says, you're infants, you're children. You're on like simple things right here. If you're going to be mature, unified, strong, well-grounded Christians, you have, to, you have to grow beyond. And once again, I love and honor the gifts of the Spirit. We are a prophetic church. We have a strong prophetic team. But what I love about their t our team is they know it's not just about them. It's about them contributing to the greater good of the body of Christ. And you can pray in tongues, and you can prophesy, and you can heal the sick. And if you're not rooted and grounded in love, you're a gong show is what Paul says. You're just a clanging symbol. Hard words, right? And so he, he, he's trying to get them to understand we, we have to grow up. We have to mature. And see, the people of Corinth, they were those types that they chased prophetic word after prophetic word. Prophetic dream or vision after prophetic dream or vision. They subscribed to all the prophetic email list. Right? They, they lived in everywhere. And yet they wouldn't even open up the doctrine that the apostles were giving them. And so to bring a modern hermeneutic to this today. A modern application. The church in America today is full of false doctrine. And many people think it's false, false doctrine because of certain theological disagreements. But I would propose it's not so much about that. But it's about false understandings. False distractions. We have people, not so much 
maybe in this church, maybe some in this church. Once again, remember, I love you, right? <laughs> I got to read it. I love you. I'm for you, not against you. We got people who are more glued to their favorite prophetic voices and what they release every week than they are to their own Bible and the Holy Scriptures. Over the last four months, I have gotten so many videos sent to me about prophetic dreams and visions. And some from people that I know personally. I've been around this a long time. People that have good hearts. People that are humble. But you have to understand the prophetic gifting is always shaped by personality and what people consume their minds upon. And so some from even in our own denomination, a guy I know I've, I've had lunch with and he's blown up. People sending the videos and I'm saying, listen, be careful here. Be careful here. What does is, what is the Word of God say? What does the Bible teach us? What, what do we have promised for us as the people of God? Yes, we're in difficult times. But, but be careful just to jump from dream and vision and prophetic utterance. And many times the dream and the vision may be a little bit accurate. He may have saw correctly. But then when it comes to the interpretation and the application, because of what he consumes his mind with, it gets off. So maybe he sees a vision, but because he's a prepper, because he's a doomsdayer, his application is, here's my encouragement for the body of Christ. Store up on ammo and prep food. I'm not kidding. And it's blown up in America. Blown up in our own denomination. The assemblies of God. And, and I'm sitting here going, that can't be the exhortation that we give to the body of Christ. I'm not denying the vision. I'm not denying that maybe the Lord revealed. I believe in those things. But my goodness, when you consume your mindset with prepperism and uh, doomsday apocalyptic stuff, store up more ammo and buy food. Like Now, if you want to store up ammo and buy food, have at it. That's fine. That's your right. That's your freedom. You live in America. You can do that. But that is not the godly exhortation for us. We have people glued to the words of these people. Glued to the words. And not glued to the eternal word, the Logos, what the Bible says. Do I believe perilous times are coming? Sure. Sure. But I'm not, I'm not going to be dominated by fear-mongering. And suppose just because it's prophetic doesn't mean, or just because someone says it's prophetic doesn't mean it's necessarily accurate. All right, I'm on a tangent there. Forgive me. All right. Another thing, when Paul says here in verse 14, human cunning, craftiness, deceitful schemes, um, manipulative, multi-level marketing, pyramid schemes. People, when they see me as a pastor, Pastor Tim, not from here, but like outside sort of, I have an opportunity for you. I think it's good. I think it's going to be a blessing. Right? Because they see influence, they see people. And the second I begin to hear it, I go, oh, Jesus. I just, want to be, I just want to be friends. I just want to be friends. Jesus, help me. I just want to be friends with this person. How do I, how do I tell them, I'm, I hope it works out for you, but I'm not interested in manipulating my congregation to be a downstream for you. And this is, this is rampant in the church in America today. Rampant. The TV ministry even jumps onto this all the time. This, these are cunning schemes. Conspiracy theories. Selection year. Like, I'm going for the juggler here this morning. Remember, Pastor Tim loves you. Wherever you're at in all this, I love you. I'm for you. Oh, let me, let me say this. I believe there's darkness and evil in the world today. There is. There's horrific things happening in our world. There are real issues we need to be alert and aware of. But not everything is connected to deep state, globalist agenda, QAnon type of theories. All right? Like we, have, we have to be discerning better because people are falling for this stuff. Now, with every, I have a little conspiracy theory in me, if I'm honest. My dad used to have me watch these videos when I was a kid of Waco, Texas and different things. I knew about Waco before you all ever knew about Waco. I knew about it, right? So Netflix came out with a series. I'm like, I knew this at 12 years old. My dad had me watch the videos. <laughs> so I, I, I'm saying I, ha I can be easily drawn towards that. Right? And it's not the same. Every conspiracy theory has a little bit of truth in it. That's, that's the scary part. There's usually a little bit of truth, but then there's a whole lot of excess and added things. And we have Christians getting disturbed and losing their, they're their anxious over it. They're worrisome over it. They're panicked about it. And it's like, 
listen, not everything is connected in the way you think it's connected. And even if it was, even if it is, where's your hope? Where's your trust? What are you putting your reliance in? You know, the whole day of reckoning and QAnon and all that stuff and the multi-exposure. Like, like let, let's, let's be careful there. If things are exposed, praise God. I want things to be exposed. But there are distorted, twisted minds sitting behind a computer knowing how to bring division and disunity and to destroy this country. And it's coming through theories. You know what's sad is that many times they're tracing those stories and those videos and those theories to, to other countries. And we're getting divided over it. And the worst part is people would say, Pastor Jim, you're, you're just not awakened to it. You're just, you're just not. No, no, I understand what you think you understand. But I'm telling you, like Paul says, be, be careful of these things. Human cunning, craftiness and deceitful schemes. Every wind of doctrine. We need to be sound in our doctrine. We need to have a sound mind. We need to be careful about every little video that your uncle and your aunt or your friend sends you not to believe it's necessarily true. Just because one person says it doesn't mean it's true. In all things. Right? All right, let's move on. Choppy again. Here we go. Verse 15. Paul says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. John 1, 17 says that the spirit of Jesus is always full of grace and truth. Next slide here. When it comes to Christianity, and I speak corporately, uh, the church and individuals, that's Christians. Next slide here. We tend to gravitate or tend to swing our pendulums towards one of these two extremes. That of legalism or that of what's called relativism. And I believe as Christians we're called to be so Christocentric cross-centric, Jesus-centric, that we learn what it is to walk in the tension, not going too far in the realm of legalism and not going into, too far into the realm of relativism. Now what happens is sometimes, see legalism is all about rules, do's and don'ts. Doing in order to obtain. Relativism in the Christian world usually is like all about free grace and hyper grace and, and then we can just live however the heck we want and there, it's, be careful to define truth. We just want to love everyone. But yes, we want to love everyone, but there's still truth. And we have to stand for truth. But what happens is sometimes when you grew up in legalism, like, like I did, when you start to get a little bit liberated from it, it becomes easy to swing that pendulum way over into the realm of just liberation. Relativism, anything goes, and I'm covered by love and grace. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Now I'll live however the heck I want. Right? And then opposite, some of the most legalistic people I know today were former anarchists and hippies and drug addicts. And they come out of that, and they quickly swing that pendulum way over into the realm of fundamentalism and legalism. And I believe as a church, what Paul is talking about here in the idea of speaking truth and in love is we learn to embrace this tension. We're not overly legalistic. We're not overly just free-flowing, utopian ideals, anything goes. But we learn to walk in this, this tension, this centrist type of the Spirit leading us. the spirit lead, and, and we live out of the conviction of what the Word says and the Spirit births in us. But we're not becoming super legalistic and fundamentalist about it. And self-righteous. But we're also not afraid and we don't cower when everything's trying to be questioned about what is true. That makes sense? Tim Keller, he said this in his book, Center Church. He said, on one hand, legalism stresses truth without grace. For it claims that we must obey the truth to be saved. On the other hand, relativism stresses grace without truth. For it claims we are all accepted by God, if there is a God. And we each have to decide what is true for us. We must never forget that Jesus was full of grace and truth. Any religion or philosophy of life that de-emphasizes or loses one or the other of these truths falls into legalism or license. Either way, the joy and power and release of the gospel are stolen by one thief or the other. I, I, I love that. Next slide here. Rich Velotis, he's a pastor in Queens, New York. He gives this chart. Between these tensions of high grace, low grace, high truth, low truth. 
And the truth is, we tend to, we tend to think in these paradigms. If you're a person that's high grace, low truth, you end up enabling yourself, but also enabling others. If you're a church that is high grace, everyone's welcome, everyone's love, and we affirm every little sin about your life, you end up enabling, not empowering. If you're a church that is low truth and low grace, it's just passivity. And we, unfortunately, we have churches like this today. They're not even engaged with the battle that we're in. It's, oh my gosh, I don't care if it's us four no more. I'm just going low grace, low truth. It becomes nothing more than a country club. If you're high truth and you're low grace, we contend for truth here at this church. We preach the word. We're not afraid of anyone. We protest everything. It's condemnation. Right? It's a spirit of condemnation. You, you, you may be speaking truth. Metro used to say you can be right and be so wrong. Hello? You can be right and be so wrong. You can be supposedly con contending for truth and speaking truth. But at the end of the day, you're just a jerk. And that's my filtered version of saying it. You're just a jerk. You're not exemplifying the grace and the love and the humility. But if we're a church that is high grace and high truth, this is what biblical love looks like. This is what agape love looks like. And this is the maturity and the unity that Jesus wants to see happen in his bride. High truth, high grace. But this is the hardest tension to walk in. Because when you're so full of grace and mercy and love, because you've been shown so much mercy, grace, and love, people will say things about you that just aren't true. When you're so full of truth because you genuinely care and it's rooted in love, people will say things about you that aren't true. I thought you guys were full of love and accepted. Yeah, but I still believe God has every right to speak to your sexuality. Because he knows what he created. And he knows what's best for you. I don't say that in condemnation. I don't say that in judgment. I will love and I will accept anyone. But I do believe the Spirit wants to change you and transform you and renew you. Well, that sounds like conversion therapy. That's what Christianity has been from day one. Conversion. We either believe this thing or we don't. Can Jesus change the even most hardest and broken heart? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I want to walk that out in high grace and high truth, not compromise. And that is so hard because in our modern society, what we do is we categorize, we generalize, and then we dismiss. We cancel. Oh, you're one of them, so I'll make my sweeping generalization about what you're saying here, and then I'll dismiss you and cancel you. We've got to be better in the body of Christ. We've got to walk that tension of high grace and truth, and it will be the hardest journey for any church to go on. But I believe it's worth it. It's easier to go to the other extremes. Way easier. But that, that tension is hard. and That's not cowering. That's hard. It's really hard. Verse 16. Paul says, From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. The great commentator Peter O'Brien said, Christ is not only the goal of the body's growth. As the head who rules over the body, he is the ultimate source of its growth. For he supplies all that is necessary for its well-being, including its unity, nourishment, and progress. Now, just a couple concluding thoughts here this morning. At the beginning of the COVID quarantine, and we were all shut down, I believe that an opportunity was extended to the church in Western culture. An opportunity to rediscover what Jesus always intended the church to be. Not to be entertainment driven. Not to be consumer driven. Not to try to be the best show in town. Not to be built off the personality and charisma of one person. Or the experts. But to really rediscover a five-fold functioning ecclesia. Walking in identity and power that the gates of hell would not be able to prevail against. Great missiologist Alan Hirsch, he said, 
the beginning of COVID, he said, if you, if you want to become a better chess player, my eight-year-old daughter and I have been playing chess multiple times a week, and she's starting to beat me. It scares me because I'm a strategist. And, and my over-strategizing, she's doing things, and I'm like, ah, oh, checkmate. How'd that happen? <laughs> right? And I, I love the game of chess. But Alan Hurst said, if you want to get better at playing chess, remove the queen and learn how to utilize all the other parts. Because the queen is the most versatile piece, Right? When you lose your queen, you're like, oh, no, i got to get my queen back. i got to get that little rascal pawn up to the end so I can get my queen back. For too long in the church in North America, the Sunday morning has been our queen. Most of our staff meetings, most of our resources, most of our planning, most of our time goes towards a one and a half hour service on Sunday morning. And... In COVID, what has happened is we've realized that we've been overemphasizing or overfocusing on one piece that can easily be removed at any time. And so if we're going to move forward into the 21st century, being the, no matter what comes our way, no matter what persecution, no matter what hardship, and I believe it's coming, we've got to activate the body of Christ in all these other anointings and functions and giftings. And we thank God for this. Like I, I hope this never goes away, but if it does, the church doesn't stop. Because the people are rising up their anointings and their giftings and their functioning. And the church continues to go forward. We put, two, we put all our apples into one basket called Sunday morning. Attractional ministry. And we were always meant to be a missional people. Is this important? Absolutely. But what is this? Fellowship. Worshiping with the saints. We should have testimonies in these services. The sacraments. It's the opening of the scriptures. It's the prophesying and the singing and the praying. And then it's go out on mission from this place and make a difference in your world. Make a difference in your neighborhood. Rise up to the gift. And for too many, too many churches, even in the evangelistic model, once again, I, I know I maybe sound cynical, but we, we see it too much in the American church. Their discipleship is growth tracks and next steps. And all right, go to our growth track. Learn about our core values. Three steps. Go through this next steps. We're going to have you do a spiritual gifts assessment. And once again, oh, you tested high in apostolic, go hold the sign. You tested high in the prophetic, go volunteer in the nursery. Go be the head usher. Volunteerism is, is needed. We don't have nursery in our 9 a.m. service because we just don't have volunteers right now. Right? And, and people are, it's hard before COVID, but it's even harder now. But my goal here at Genesis is not to raise you up to be more volunteers. Cogs in the machine. My goal is to have you discover your identity of who you are in Christ. Rise in your anointing. And whether you're doing that here or whether you're doing that in your workplace or in your neighborhood or in some program you volunteer, you begin to function in one of those five-fold ministry gifts. You don't walk around saying, I'm apostolic. You just go be apostolic. I'm prophetic. No, you just go be prophetic. Right? Is this making any sense? And, and this, is, this is God's game plan. This is God's game plan to, to raise up a unified and mature body. Once again, that Jesus said he would build and the gates of hell could not stop it. So we've got a lot of work to do. We've got some restructuring and rethinking to do. We've got to change some of our attention and our thought patterns and our focuses. And we've got to start empowering people and releasing people. Amen. man, we've got to start empowering people. I want to know who the prophetic people are in the church. I want to know who the evangelistic people are. And we want to equip. And then we need to release, release, release. And some of it will happen here. Beautiful. But I'm more excited about when it happens out there. In your workplace. In your core group of friends. All right. Let's stand. If you're offended by any of my tangents today, I, I do apologize. Like, in the sense of, like, I'm not trying to just harp on something. Sometimes you've got to speak, I'm going to say truth. <laughs> There's a lot of things pulling for your attention right now. There's a lot of things trying to get you distracted. We have got to discern better than we've been discerning. We've got to be alert and resolute in our focus. The world will be the world. We want to bring difference to the world. Don't, don't get me wrong there. But let's not get bogged down with every little thing that comes across our feed and our lives. Let's look at what is the kingdom of Jesus and let's be committed to that.
And many times it does involve things in the world that we need to bring and address and confront. But do it from a kingdom ethic. Do it from a son and daughter who belongs to Jesus first and foremost. And let that be the defining thing of how you're functioning and ministering. So let me pray over you as I dismiss you today. No great altar call for this one other than just go and be. <laughs> Amen. Let me ask this. How many people have ever felt, and don't be afraid, don't be afraid. How many people have ever felt like you're just, you're an entrepreneur. You're just kind of wired that way. You think 30,000 feet. I know you are, Ryan, for sure. Like, that's, that's you. You're just thinking big picture. You don't really like all the nitty-gritty details, right? I just want to bless that today in Jesus' name. And, and a true biblical apostle is not just I'm an entrepreneur, but how can I use, how can I innovate, create, so that I can be a sent one on mission for Jesus? How many here you feel like you're, maybe you're prophetic by nature. You feel like you hear things, you see things, you got thoughts um, come to your mind. You're like, man, that's not just bad pizza. That, that may be the spirit talking to me. Anybody feel that ever? Like, yeah, visions, dreams, yeah. Beautiful. I, I bless that in you today. A great book to read would be Growing in the Prophetic by Mike Bickle. I don't agree with everything that Mike Bickle has ever taught. But, man, that book on the prophetic is one of the best books I've ever read. Jack Deere has a phenomenal book on the prophetic ministry. Very well balanced. Jack Deere was a cessationist at Dallas Theological Seminary. And the Holy Spirit got a hold of him and said, you're wrong. <laughs> how many people feel like, how many, you're just evangelistic. What's funny is most of the evangelists don't know, but all their friends know they're evangelists. <laughs> right? If I said, Matt, you're evangelist, like, Matt, I'm just preaching Jesus. <laughs> you're an evangelist, right? If, that, if that's you today, I, I bless that in you. I'm like, go, share it, gather, bring people into your, your spheres of influence and preach Jesus to them. Maybe you're here and you're pastoral. You, you're the nurturer. You're the carer. Like, it could be motherly. It could be fatherly. You just, you just want to love people. You, just, you empathize with people well. Some people, don't empath, some people don't know empathy at all, right? But you, you can enter into people's grief and their sorrow and you can, you can be present in that. That's a pastoral anointing. It's not just for this. It's, it's for you being activated. If you're here and you geek out on theology and doctrine and you love to teach, you, you get wired about that, then, then you need to find ways you can do that. Maybe in a core group or a home group or just with two or three friends. You just start sharing what you're learning through the scriptures. Right? And you're using terminology, they're like, huh? What does that mean? Well, let, me, let me tell you what it means. Right? People always say, use terminology I don't even know. Good. We need to learn this terminology. You can always Google it. I'll usually try to explain it, right? So we, we bless these gifts in the body of Christ. Amen? We bless these gifts. And we want to mature and grow up into the things of Jesus. So, Lord, I thank you for your church. I thank you for your people. I thank you for the gifts that you have given to us. And, Lord, I just pray right now through the power of the Spirit that you would cause these gifts to flourish to rise and create team type of ministry here at Genesis. Connect people with people that also function that way so that they can work together towards seeing your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And the thing about this as you go this, this morning, I don't want to over-program this. We could do all the programs, oh, all the prophetic people here, all the, no, th this needs to happen, like organically. You need to connect, you need to, and sometimes they're not even like-minded people, but you see how they add value to your circle, to your sphere. And so be released in your gifting, and all that you do this week, walk in love and truth. Model that tension. Walk in that, it's hard, it's going to get harder over the next several weeks. Walk in that tension. Amen, bless you, have an incredible week.